Hey, welcome to Left Right Out. I'm going to go. This one's going to be a little shorter than the last few days because I, you know, I got things I got to do as well. But uh, we're going to go mainly in the financial realm here because uh, there was a good article that came out um, from Charles Hugh Smith uh, of Two Minds blog. I think he writes for some other things too. But it, the, the title really struck me because it's something I talk about a lot, and that is. Um, well, if you, I'd rather you, you pull it up and read it yourself. I'll go through some excerpts because I don't want to take any kind of credit, credit from this guy. Uh, but he, he uh, illustrates a lot of the points that I make uh, with regard to our, uh, our current economic system here. But it's the illusion of getting rich while producing nothing. And if that title doesn't grip you, I don't know what will because that's, we see it all over the place. But he goes through. There's some key points here. It's really a concise article. And... Uh, well written within the points of what you know that that title in, infers. So, um, like I go through here, I'm gonna go uh, like all mass illusion. The greater the disconnect from reality, the greater the appeal. You know, he writes, uh, mass illusions gain their escape velocity by leaving any ties to real world limit limitations behind, and by igniting the most powerful booster to human human euphoric confidence, known as greed, which you see that in a lot of uh, markets here. Um, Where's another? There's another just a, a great one. Um, he's talking about <clears throat> the fantasy powering the spe speculative frenzy is one. I get rich, I'll stop working and live off my wealth. Which, you know, if it's produ produ tied to productivity, I can see that. But this is what he gets in the, in the mass delusion that infinite wealth can be generated without producing anything. Creating value has no value. Which I can see that it's uh, the delusion is that I can get rich producing nothing but speculative gains, and then I can buy all the stuff somebody else is making. If that is in America, like in a nutshell, I have no idea what it is because that's pretty much what we do. We produce almost nothing. We allow the world to produce things, and we ship and export dollars. And somehow they're still taking them, and uh, we get all their cheap. Uh, ever degrading, you know, crap. Um, but anyway, and it goes on in the meme stock thing, goes on the cryptocurrency, you know, that ties into it and some of the other things he brings up. But I was looking at all the new crypt, all the cryptocurrencies out there, which I can see the use case for like a Bitcoin, possibly, you know, Ethereum. But some of these other uh, coins like Dogecoin and uh, Shiba Inu, which I've put, you know, a few dollars in some of these, but I was like, well, what's the use case for this? Like, what is it? It's pure speculation at some point. It's like not new technology like Bitcoin is brought in, you know, of, I get, you know, arguably various new technologies, the block, you know, utilizing blockchain and uh, it's being accepted as a currency and elsewhere. But some of these other ones are not. There's no use. People are just pouring in money in, in, in a speculative frenzy. There's no product. He said it, he's alluded to in the article. There's no productivity tied to that, so it's not really wealth creation in a sense. You're playing the greater fool's game, um, but that's what it is. He goes into it a little bit about the how you know people are flipping houses without doing adding any you know additional value to them. They're just you know buying them, and then you know next thing you know that you know the, how parabolic this the housing market is. You just turn around and sell it, and they're. And the meme stock thing, which, you know, I, you know, the sentiment on that, I, I agree with. And I followed that, um, that group for a while. And I, you know, maybe I should have put in on some of them like AMC or, or AMC and uh, GameStop. But I saw it, you know, I still look at the world as looking for some real value. But uh, they got together and they try to break the people that are the very people that are manipulating a lot of these things. But so I get that. Um, but at the same time, you know, that, that's not real value. Uh, he also, here's some cool cool ones he goes into. It's like working for monopolies and cartels is for chumps because monopolies and cartels have zero incentive to share profits with mere employees. And there is some truth. I've worked in retail and I know a lot of people do. And unless they're really pressured, they just treat you like uh, a, there's a revolving door of employees. And and then he goes into some of the other uh, you know cues that people are getting from billionaires that are able to, here, I'll just read this little, uh, all right, this is how you haul out a nation and guarantee collapse. The most rewarding skill sets are a psychopathological obsession with maximizing profits by any means available and speculating with Fed free money for financiers. Now, greed and uh, maximizing profits isn't bad, but when you have no, when it's uh, 
capital, what they call socializing losses, where there's no, you know, um, uh, correction or no, uh, uh, you know, rod for, you know, or I, man, I can't believe I lost that term. But anyway, no negativity, no negative consequences for, you know, making bad investments and you get all, you, you, uh, you, you can get the gains for, you know, these speculative, speculative, uh, actions, then you really have no market. And it's just like, well, you'll just do by any means necessary, no matter what, no matter what the consequences are. But anyway, it goes, the millions of retail speculators are simply picking up cues given by billionaires who gain their wealth by issuing debt. Okay. Yeah. Funded fund stock buybacks. Yeah. We've seen that. And other financial manipulation instead of investing in the company itself they buy stock back which is fine i mean they that's private companies they do that but they also uh you know buying assets with essentially free money we see that with blackrock going into the real estate market overbidding on listing prices um and they're essentially getting their money for nothing and you know trying to cash flow that but anyway uh it's an interesting article it's uh like I said, it's you know to the point, and it's a, it's a good read. But that ties into something else here. So we go over here, and there's another article from Reuters, and it talks about rising energy prices will hit the poorest Americans. Well, it kind of ties into that same thing. So when we see uh, the consequences of inflationary monetary policy and and other things that exacerbate that, whether it be not drilling uh, domestically or increased uh, demand or uh, when, especially when you have so many dollars floating out there, but who, uh, who gets hurt when you see the gas pumps uh, prices go up or food prices more so than anybody else? Well, that's the poor Americans. And what is the reasoning behind that? Well, they um, typically don't have assets that can keep up with uh, in inflation uh, or the consequences of inflation. So they're running off cash or running off debt or what, or if you're running off debt, you might actually be better off. But if you're, they're running off pure cash, and their uh, their their cash flow is based off their labor, uh, or I guess government transfer payments. But let's just assume that labor they're actually working, and that hardly ever keeps up with the rising prices of uh, of consumer goods, um, or necessary goods, food, food and energy, housing, or whatnot. We're seeing that right now. I don't, you know. You get a bump from fifteen dollars to twenty dollars an hour. It's not going to even. I mean, it's not keeping up with what's going on in in the nation at, the, at currently. So I'm, you know, just going through this real quick. But uh, it's uh, but it's it's simple. See, so back in the day when we had actual, well, they're still manipulated interest rates, but they're more realistic to a real market. The average guy doesn't have to be speculating in the market. He isn't driven to throw his money into the stock market or into riskier assets. You can go put your money in a bank account, save it make whatever five to 10 percent interest uh, whatever the case may be whatever the natural rate of interest is the market rate of interest which we know it's not zero but uh let's say it's five to ten percent you can theoretically work even you know just a simple job maybe work at an auto parts uh o'reilly's or something or even mcdonald's you save your money and it works for you. I mean, you're actually making money over the rate of of inflation, or if or if the Fed actually did what they're supposed to do and stabilized prices and stabilized the currency with the rate of production or, uh, of the nation, then you'd actually you you'd be w well off, and you can actually save money over 20 years or so, and and be able to live off that, retire, or you know, eventually get into other assets like maybe real estate or something else that's cash flowing and build generational wealth. Well, you can't do that anymore because you're in this ever increasing battle of, of, of trying to maintain your purchasing power. And you can't just say when you throw money in any, even the highest yielding bank account and you're losing money, you're losing purchasing power. Maybe not, you know, nominally you have money in there, uh, but over, you know, the actual, um, the actual uh, purchasing power of that, that money is decreasing and is starting to come almost like almost exponential, but we're at a rate of, of, um, a devaluation that's unprecedented. we uh, for many years, but anyway, so yeah, it's going to hurt the most, um, the people that we do, the least amount of the, the people that can least afford it. So if you look at Reuters, the rising energy price will hit the poorest households like, duh, it's like, where the hell have you been living? It's like, what, why do we, this is one thing that drives me nuts. We're always looking for a study or something. It's like, what happened to just logical reasoning? Uh, 
you know, simple deduction. Uh, we don't teach critical skill or critical thinking or reasoning anymore in school. It's always an appeal. It seems like we're a greater amount. It goes to appeal to a higher authority instead of being able to use your own mind. And, um, and I see a lot of people, well, where'd you get your degree? Well, it's, <laughs> I can, te- one, you can, nowadays you can teach yourself, but two, I can use a mind, my mind to just simply connect the dots. I have a sim- even a basic understanding of certain concepts. You can, you know, at least come to some logical conclusion. And just because you have a degree doesn't give you any more of an authority, especially nowadays with uh, the worth of college degrees. It doesn't give you any more authority than anybody else. I, I, I lend merit to the argument rather than the person um, when it comes to certain things, especially economics. Um, there's so much there. I mean, it's one of the groogeries that if you go to get a degree in economics, you're almost dumber when you come out. But it goes for anything else, uh, especially nowadays, because uh, it's more about the person's his ability to reason and to um, to develop uh, original thoughts and to deduce truth from untruth by you know looking at a preponderance of evidence, which we don't have that. Like I said, it's more of an I see more so than ever a appeal to authority. It's like, well, this guy believes it, this guy studied it, or whatever this, and it must be so. And your ar- your argument to the contrary must uh, must be uh, must be untrue just because he has a piece of paper from a uh, university that whatever says such and such, which. To me, a degree will give you a greater propensity to be right or a greater maybe understanding of certain basic concepts, but it doesn't necessarily mean you are going to be right. I mean, it's like I said, weigh the argument. There's truth or or there's something that's factual or something that's not. There's a good argument. There's a bad argument. And yeah, there's nuance in that. But anyway, so I'm going to keep it there. There's a lot of other things that are going on. Like, so the Millie thing is evolving. Uh, You got some more people calling out for his resignation, but and still, you know, isn't it, isn't it, um, Interesting that n- nobody has resigned over just the Afghanistan thing. Uh, if anything, you know, Milley as an advisor, as a general, he should be being he should be getting questioned o- over that. Uh, not only his prior conduct with the call to the you know Chinese uh, behind Trump's back, and apparently not even uh, uh, circumventing his own immediate chain of command with the Secretary of Defense, which. Oof, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how. You, what mental gymnastics you go through to justify that? But uh, uh, nobody, uh, with regards to any of that, uh, is being held accountable, and it confounds the mind because you have other guys that, like I said, the they fart the wrong way, and they have a SWAT team going down that they're being financially destroyed, torn up through the media, and um, and they all seem to be of one persuasion. Um, um, ideologically, and the other side, ideological persuasion, if you want to group in the, the, the two teams, um, seems to be able to get away pretty much with murder at times. And they get away with the most, uh, you know, hypocrisy. Uh, they break law, they lie to Congress, um, and nothing seems to ever happen. Uh, it's astounding. And I don't know what you do about it anymore because. Uh, we scream and cry over here, but nobody seems to be willing to stick their neck out and stand by the principal and, and put somebody to task. And hopefully that is, you know, Rand Paul has been trying to, but we'll see because his appeals to even get like Fauci who lied in front of Congress to, uh, to have the uh, DOJ look at his, his, uh, I, I can't remember what they filed uh, to the DOJ, uh, per, you know, perjury, I get either perjury charges or I don't know what they, if you lie under oath to Congress, what, what exactly that is, but he filed something with the DOJ and we'll see what happens there, but, um, we'll see what he does. He's calling for some, he's talking about Millie too, and we'll see what happens there, but I doubt they'll do anything. Once you get up there, you're too connected with one another. I remember going to, uh, or being around that area when I, <clears throat> when I was an officer, but I also, I have some other, you know, political things that I did in the, in the past, but I remember uh, hearing about the congressional staff members and, and I, I guess it's not the same today, but then I remember there was a, a number of the head, you know, dudes, their staff members, you know, they play this game of being opposed to each other, but at the same time, they're out like eating dinner together, or vacationing and their staff is vacationing together, playing games, doing, you know, whatever you know, young kid people do and then also the members of congress themselves you know shaking hands and then when they're on tv 
score rating each other. It's uh, it, it was pretty astounding. But anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I'll talk to you later.